Well, good evening. On behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we are excited to welcome you to the third lecture in our Spring Learning Grow series. It's entitled Planting Companion Gardens. I'm Sue Boyer, president of the Falcon Board. As part of the Friends mission, we want to help to educate gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. To that end, we are hosting our annual Learn and Grow series. So far, we've learned about soil basics, small space gardening, and tonight, how to pair edible plants with annuals for beautiful containers. I would like to remind you that if you missed any of our past lectures in the series or others from the past, you may find them at our website, fopcon.org, where you can review the lecture at your leisure. Please remember to leave yourselves muted, muted during the presentation, and that will help us to have a better audio quality. Uh, but remember to also put your questions in any time during the chat. Amy Lavery, our co-host uh, and volunteer coordinator, will be managing the chat at the end of the talk and present your questions to our expert, Suzette. You will also be receiving an email after tonight's presentation to let us know about your experience this evening and any future topics you would like us to present. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our special guest this evening, Master Gardener Suzette Gasek. Suzette's interest in gardening began in Michigan during her childhood. Her relatives had orchards, farms, and gardens. As a teacher and later librarian, she always pursued gardening. Suzette has special interests in native plants, composting, and attracting pollinators to gardens. The Oak Park Conservatory was always a special destination for her family. She remembers the very early days when the plant sale was known as the herb sale, and that was what we sold, only herbs. She's delighted to have volunteers, and it has been delighted to volunteer at the conservatory over the years. So now I'm turning over the program to Suzette. Okay, thank you so much. It's so good to see everyone here. Um, looks like maybe we lucked out with the storm, eh? All right, I have a lot of information that I want to present to you. I'm glad that Sue mentioned about how the plant sale used to be the herb sale and so forth, because a lot of companion plants are herbs, and I'll be talking about their benefits and why they're useful. And so I kind of added companion planting with vegetables plus, because I have a few little tidbits that I want to add to you. All right, so let's get started. All right. So um, you might find it beneficial to get the gallery out of the way so that you can kind of focus in on the screens and so forth. Um, I like the word foodscaping. Um, and I think that fits with our companion planting because the idea is that when we're gardening, uh, it used to be that it was only, you know, you got your vegetables here, you got your flowers here, your roses over there. And now, we're discovering it's so beneficial to mix everything together. And so that where you're growing your vegetables, can they can also be a thing of beauty, okay? You can stick in some chard and some lettuce and so forth, or maybe parsley by your uh, rose bushes and things. And I'll kind of explain why you might want to do it. And it adds a lot of color and texture. So foodscaping is the art of combining edibles and ornamentals for visual appeal that creates a healthy environment for growing our plants. So the topics that I want to cover with you this evening are the benefits of companion planting. I want to talk about specific types of companion plants. I'm going to give you some tips, and I hope some of them are fun for you and you enjoy them. And I'll finally finish up with the resources that I use so that you can continue to explore and learn as you garden. So let's talk about the benefits. All right. Uh, the benefits of foodscaping or using Companion plants are, you're gonna have improved taste and nutrition in your food. It's convenient, okay? Um, just because when you go out into your garden, you got everything right there. You've got your flowers, you've got your vegetables. You're gonna have increased food security. And what I mean about that is that you know that the food you grow is safe for you to eat. And you can choose where to buy your plants and everything. If you wanna be 
truly organic and you want to avoid pesticides and so forth, um, that's why I love the plant sale at the conservatory because I know how those plants have been grown and so forth. And I feel very safe that no poisons, pesticides, or anything were used on it. You're going to obviously reduce your food cost when you're growing your own vegetables. It's fun. It gives you exercise. I do a lot of bending and stretching when I garden. Um, sustainability. And what I mean about that is that when you are growing the proper plants and so forth, you can be enriching your soil at the same time. And I'll be giving you some examples as we're going through so you understand that. And of course, it's better ecologically. And my whole goal here is to be able to bring in pollinators, bring in beneficial insects, find a way to um, trap put insects that are not good for our crops and so forth, but I don't have to use spray and I don't have to use fertilizers, okay? All right. Now, let's talk about companion plants in general. Can plant, companion plants are plants that grow well together and they benefit each other. They attract beneficial insects, repel pests, provide nutrients, shade, or support, and you're going to be improving your pollination. Uh, companion plant planting also enhances the flavor, the yield, and the quality of your crops. And as I mentioned before, you're reducing the need for pesticides and fertilizers. Some examples of companion plants are basils and tomatoes, okay? Um, marigolds, and I'm having trouble seeing my screen. <laughs> Sorry. And marigolds and borage and onions and nasturtiums and computers, uh, cucumber, sorry. Companion planting is a way of creating a diverse and harmonious plant community that mimics the natural ecosystems and promotes those ecological balances. Okay, so common planting is, companion planting has been around forever, okay? And so this is a picture of the three sisters, okay? Um, in Mexico, our Native American Indians, they made use of the three sisters. And the reason why it's a good example is that at the base of the three sisters, sisters you have your squash growing, okay? And then you're gonna have your beans and they're gonna wrap around the corn. And there's a couple useful things going on here. First of all, squash leaves are scratchy. So that kind of keeps away maybe some of the animals and stuff. They're not gonna be that happy about climbing over those type of leaves. The beans use the corn as support, but the beans do something wonderful. Beans and peas pull nitrogen from the air and they bring it down into the soil and that enriches the soil. And so they might've not known the scientific principles behind it, but boy, they were doing the right thing when they started to do the three sisters. So here are some companion plants. And if you look at those lovely miracles, those are the two varieties that are available at our plant sale. And miracles are probably one of the top companion plants, okay? And so your screen, it's very small here, but I'll just throw out a few things here. Um, you've all heard about using marigolds with tomatoes and stuff. And the reason is they're good at getting rid of the root knot nematoids in the soil and that pungent smell of the marigold kind of discourages pests, okay? Such as the tomato hornworms from attacking your crop. Okay, um, marigolds are great with potatoes. They deter the Colorado potato beetle, beetles and adding those marigolds to the potato bed is really a natural organic way to keep those bugs off the crop. And the flowers also protect the sweet potato vines as well. So you can put it in um, one of your containers where you have your vines growing, okay? whether they're sweet potatoes or the more decorative ones you might use in your containers. Um, bush beans are great, okay? Marigolds are good by repelling the Mexican bean beetle. And the same thing with the pole beans and peas because those are trellis uh, 
crops, you're gonna plant those marigolds at the base, okay? Once more, green beans are protected from the Mexican bean beetles by the marigolds. And cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, and squash all benefit from the marigolds because they help repel cucumber beetles and they also act as a trap crop for flea beetles, okay? Another type of pest. And of course, who doesn't love brightly colored flowers? And the bees love them and other pollinators are attracted to them. So that's another benefit that your vegetable plants are more likely to be fully pollinated by attracting those pollinators. Okay, another great companion plant that is marvelous to add are nasturtiums. This is a picture of a variety of nasturtium that's being sold at the plant sale. And nasturtiums are plants that are used as trap crops for attracting aphids or squash bugs. And what I mean by a tra trap crop is not the bait, but more that the insects that might eat your plants are going to be drawn to the nasturtiums. Okay. And they'll use those rather than attacking your vegetable crop. So mm -hmm. nasturtiums then draw such pests away from the vegetables like the tomato and the squash. They also attract good bugs. And that's really important to attract good bugs, such as the pollinators and hoverflies, okay? Yeah, it's a, hoverflies are a great predator of common pests like aphids. I hear people complain, oh, my milkweed is covered with aphids and things like that. Well, if you're having an issue with that, plant some nasturtium around them, okay? And that's really going to help. So let's talk about some crops that we grow and what they're good for and what are excellent companions. So if I plant basil, and of course we sell a lot of basil at the plant sale, we know it's gonna help tomatoes by repelling hookworms and flies. Um, if you have basil near your asparagus, the combination of those two attract ladybugs, which are wonderful pest control insects to have. And so they're going to be getting rid of aphids. Ladybugs are terrific at getting rid of aphids and other pests. Um, with peppers, basil is doubly effective because it repels the garden pest and it provides a dense ground cover underneath. Since peppers um, tend to be a little bit taller and they prefer humidity, the basil works to kind of trap the heat and the moisture in the soil. So plant some of your basil around your pepper plants. Um, basil is also very beneficial with root vegetables. The leafy green tops of parsnips, radishes, and turnips, and carrots all benefit from the pest repelling aroma of nearby basil plants. And just like basil is a companion plant, basil has companions it likes. So um, borage is great to have around. In fact, borage is a wonderful companion plant in many ways because it attracts pollinators. Um, if I have my basil near chamomile and oregano and chives, I am gonna be increasing the strength of the essential oils in those plants, okay? All good things. Okay, let's talk about peppers. Um, this happens to be one type of pepper that's being sold at the plant sale. The, I think the snackabelle, if I recall correctly. And, what I can do is I could have my peppers growing in a container, but I could plant some of these companion plants to protect them. So I want to consider basil, majorum, onions, oregano. Um, it's going to benefit from the herbs because they have a protective insecticidal quality. And other great ones to use are thyme, dill, cilantro, and parsley. Uh, flowering plants that I might like to have around my peppers because sometimes people will complain that boy my pepper blossoms are falling off and stuff they might not be getting pollinated the way that you would like them to so maybe hesop, bee balm, anise, borage, marigolds, and nasturtiums, uh, geraniums okay all of those things will help to attract those pollinators make sure those blossoms on your pepper plants get pollinated and you have plenty of peppers. 
Okay, let's talk about cucumbers. Good companions for cucumbers are beans, borage, dill, lettuce, nasturtium, oregano, radish, sunflowers, and pansies. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about sunflowers a little bit later, so pay attention when I do talk about that. Um, dill is gonna protect the cucumbers from aphids and mites. The nasturtiums are going to deter aphids and beetles and improve the growth and the flavor of your cucumbers and oregano just is great at deterring pests in general. And radish and tansy help repel cucumber beetles, okay? Um, every year around, got birder in here, every year around uh, St. Patrick's Day, I go out and I plant peas and I plant spinach because I know they're going to survive the cold weather. So even though we've had this fluctuation in temperature and we had snow and last week and things like that, I don't have to worry about those plants. And part of the reason I like to get out there and make sure that I get my peas in early, is I mentioned before about beans and peas draw nitrogen out of the air and bring it down into the soil. So my peas are already starting to climb up the trellis, okay? And once they get up there and they start to set fruit, I will plant cucumber seeds right by that same trellis. And I know that those cucumbers are going to benefit from peas growing there before because of the added nutrients to the soil. So here's some garden ideas, you know, when you're looking at it, you know, okay, so how do I add the flowers into my beds? Well, you can do it in raised beds, okay? So they don't just have to be plain old vegetables. I can do it in containers. So you can see the containers here. It looks like they have some peppers and tomatoes in there. And I'm seeing lots of marigold planted at the base. Once more, we've talked about the benefits of having those together. And when I do it in ground, why does it just have to be flowers? I mean, I'm seeing um, dinosaur kale there. I'm seeing chard there. I'm seeing, you know, black-eyed Susans and so forth. So it can be beautiful besides functional. Uh, let's talk about how we can help our summer squash and zucchini, okay? Flowers like nasturtiums and marigolds will act as that trap crop. I mentioned that before. It's a plant used to attract pests from another crop. Um, it'll protect it from flea beetles and aphids. Um, nasturtiums are also great at repelling uh, squash vine borders. How many times have you seen a borer? go into one of the stalks on your zucchini, okay? This is where you need to make use of having companion plants to prevent that from happening. So fragrant herbs like peppermint, dill, oregano, lemon balm, and parsley all ward off those pests and insects from the squashes. And of course, blooming herbs like borage to trap honeybees, which are crucial pollinators for any garden. Okay, and kale and Swiss chard always seem to be popular plants, okay, especially at the plant sale. So companion plants that I want to use with kale include onions, garlic, leeks, peas, and radishes. Friendly herbs such as lemongrass, dill, and chives should be included. And flowering buddies that might be good with your kale are marigolds, nasturtium, and sweet alyssum. Alyssum's great at um, taking care of some of the aphids and things like that as well. Switch charge companion plants um, might be celery, mint, garlic, cilantro, and they help repel those pesky insects, okay? And don't forget our other companion ones like marigolds and dispersions because they're going to act as a trap, okay? But they'll also attract the valuable pollinators. Beans and radishes and thyme, are going to improve the soil condition, so you'll be able to grow the best charred vegetables. Eggplant. So some companion plants that I might wanna use with eggplant. Leafy greens are great. Since the eggplants tend to be taller, they can provide shade during 
the hot days. So the leaves of the pepper plant will provide extra shade. That means I'll have my spinach lasting a bit longer, my lettuce lasting longer, not bolting and becoming as bitter. They kind of also create a ground cover underneath the pepper plant that helps to retain soil mo moisture and suppress weeds that might grow. Um, and you might also consider Swiss chard and radishes placed underneath the eggplants as companion vegetables as well. Um, good companion herbs for eggplant are ones that are strongly scented to help repel insect attacks. So um, include tarragon, rosemary, chamomile, lavender, sage, dill, and majorum. Okay, and then people always kind of ask questions about broccoli and cauliflower and what can I do? I have trouble with worms and all these other things. Well, you wanna make sure that you're planting trap plants such as nasturtium and marigolds right next to them so that the cabbage worm caterpillars flock to them as opposed to your broccoli or your cauliflower. Um, good herb companions, for broccoli and cauliflower are basil, chive, dill, mint, oregano, rosemary, and thyme. And I wanna take one moment to talk about mint. Mint, as you know, can be highly invasive. So you might consider having your mint in a pot, growing as opposed to in the ground. And I can tell you, that when I first moved into my house and my very first garden, I thought, oh, it's so wonderful. I can add it to tea and it smells like. This is 40 years later, and I still will find some of that original mint, which, which I have to pull out by hand and so forth. I mean, so mint is perennial, it's forever. You got to keep on top of it. So don't make the mistake that I did when I was an avid gardener years ago. Um, put your mint in a container, okay? It's useful as a companion plant. It does wonderful things, but it is invasive. Um, let's talk about a few more herbs and that you might want to consider on their benefits. We've talked a lot already about basil and basil can improve the flavoring of other herbs. It's gonna repel flies and mosquitoes. So that's good to know. So there's nothing wrong with a pot of basil um, up on your deck or underneath your umbrella, okay? Because it's gonna keep away mosquitoes, but it's wonderful for your tomatoes, getting rid of the hornworms and different things. The one thing you don't wanna grow with basil though is sage or common rue. Um, they don't get along. Okay, and I'll talk about rue in a little while. Chamomile helps to improve the flavor of any neighboring herb. It's kind of a gentle, mild herb. Uh, it attracts beneficial insects and pollinators. It's great with cabbage, onion, and cucumber, and you can also make your own tea. Okay, garlic will repel aphids and lopers, uh, which are a type of um, worm that grows on cabbages, okay? Uh, keeps away snails and Japanese beetle. And it's a good companion for most plants. Chives repels aphids, and it's great for carrots, tomatoes, dill, and most other herbs. The only thing to be careful of with chives is to realize they'll grow in clumps, which is great. And they are perennial, they'll come up the following year, but you can always snip off some of the flowers if you don't wanna have a lot of the seeds spread all over. Uh, cilantro is great because it deters spider mites and aphids, okay? And it combines well with spinach and caraway, anise and dill. Um, some additional herbs to consider are dill, because dill also discourages spider mites, aphids, it's excellent with onions and corn and lettuce and cucumbers, but do not grow dill with carrots, tomato, fennel, and I'll talk more about fennel, lavender or caraway. They do not get along, okay? So they don't make good companions for one another. 
rosemary is wonderful. It's going to deter a variety of pests. Um, it's fine by beans and peppers, broccoli and cabbage, but carrots and pumpkins don't like rosemary. Okay, so I want to plant my rosemary in some other location. Lavender is wonderful. It's beautiful. It repels harmful pests and it attracts butterflies and it's especially good for cauliflower. All right, I told you that I don't want my garden to be boring. I like to have it filled with flowers. And there's a reason because not only are they beautiful to look at, they do wonderful things by repelling pests, attracting pollinators, okay? And so here's some I highly recommend, alyssum and borage, calendula, okay, which is the marigold family, cosmos, lavender, marigolds, nasturtiums, salvia, Salvia is so wonderful and how the bees are so attracted to it. Sweet peas, thyme, yarrow, and zinnia. And I'm gonna take a minute to talk about yarrow. Yarrow is kind of a neat plant, okay? And yarrow up in its stalks, it will draw in from the soil um, calcium, potassium, okay, uh, copper. And what you want to do with your yarrow is at the end of the season is kind of cut it up and put it down into the soil and let it decay under the soil, kind of creating a yarrow compost, so to speak. And all those nutrients that it had pulled up in its stem are going to be going back into the soil. It's going to be benefiting your soil. All right. Now, I told you I was going to talk about sunflowers again, and I love sunflowers, don't you? And sunflowers do wonderful things. They attract hoverflies, and hoverflies, by the way, are, they look like little tiny bees, but they're not bees, okay? But they look like bees, and they're great at getting rid of aphids, okay, in particular. Uh, the sunflowers attract bees, lacewings, and parasitic wasps, okay? And so, yes. Some wasps are wonderful and you want them to attract um, different caterpillars that might be attracting your cabbages, okay? And any of your other crops. Sunflowers are often referred to as a fourth sister and they should be, remember the three sisters at the beginning, the squash, the beans and the corn. Well, the fourth sister would be a sunflower and you wanna plant that on the edge of your three sister bed, okay? Um, it's best not to grow sunflowers directly in your vegetable garden bed. And the reason is they emit a kind of, excuse me, they emit a chemical that discourages seed germination and they kind of stunt the growth of plant Editors, okay? So that's why you don't want it directly in your vegetable garden, but I do want them on the side of my garden. They can be a windbreak for my garden. They can add shade, okay, to my garden because some vegetables um, don't like extreme heat, all right? Roses, okay? I wanna have beautiful roses, but how many of you have trouble with Japanese beetles and things like that. And you might notice Japanese beetle attacking other plants. So these are good pest deterrents. And I know it sounds kind of weird for some of these, but if you put marigolds and parsley and aliums, not just the bulbs, the beautiful global aliums, but onions and chives and garlic are also in that family. And petunias and sage and geraniums and rue around your roses, you are going to keep those Japanese beetles very low, okay? So try it, okay, if they happen to be an issue for you. And I hear many people complain about problems with the Japanese beetle on their roses. Ah, squirrels. I saw a lady had asked a question in the last Learn and Grow and it's like, what are you doing, squirrel? You know, and so forth. Well, 
here are some ways to humanely deal with them, okay? You can use companion plants, believe it or not, because the companion plants are gonna discourage the squirrel by surrounding or interplanting them with varieties. So they kind of turn up their noses and they won't attack those particular plants. So mints, but remember in the pot with mints, marigolds, nasturtium, or mustard, um, squirrels just don't like that scent, okay? Um, give them their own food. Okay, I know that's a little bit radical, but you might have a place where you have a squirrel feeder and, you know, put some corn over there and things like that, because you want them to keep away from your vegetables. How many of you have complained about a squirrel picking a tomato, taking a bite, and leaving it laying there, okay? Well, studies have shown they think that the squirrel really just wants something to drink. So you might be kind and have a shallow of water, okay, and so forth, so the squirrel can get a drink from that and not necessarily attack your tomatoes, uh, create a barrier, okay, um, and by that, you fencing you can have around your vegetables. Um, some people might want to use a cover over their crops, okay, uh, to prevent some pests, including squirrels, okay. Uh, surprise them, squirt them with a hose. <laughs> so if they're there and you're out there, you're like, hey, you know, um, and remember, you want to have them turn up their noses. So besides using the flowers I mentioned, you might consider things like uh, brown black pepper or chili powder around because their little noses are sensitive and their paws and things like that. Okay, they'll pick them up. So that may help. And then if you got squirrels, you usually have those dang rabbits. And I always hear people all the time who live in Oak Park. I don't know why, you know, um, it seems to be worse in your area. Okay, so some natural solutions that I want to do to keep the rabbits away. Okay, first of all, I got to tell you, rabbits are a little bit finicky and they love your plants when they're nice and young. So when they're little seedlings and they come up and they're just going to munch and you're going to see that some of the pants have been torn out and so forth. So you really need to have some type of fencing around. Um, dogs and cats can help, okay? But some of the plants that I can use to keep um, the rabbits away are the garlic, spicy basil, hot peppers, zinnia, snapdragons, and mint. Get the mint in the pot. Okay, and put those around and um, the rabbits will not be so enticed. They too um, react to natural repellents like ground black pepper, garlic powder. If you put hair snips, okay, so if you have a pet, a cat or a dog and you brush them and so forth, you can put that around. Um, putting blood meal around can kind of help. And then you can also purchase um, predator urine and it's dried and you sprinkle that around, okay? So those are some suggestions if you have a problem with those dang rabbits. Okay, so now there's some things that I want you to remember, okay? First of all, you need to remember that everything goes to, well together. They can't all be friends, I'm sorry. Okay, they all deserve to live and grow, but they don't necessarily have to be good friends. They don't have to be besties. Fennel is one. I love fennel. I grow fennel, but I grow fennel separately. Um, I love fennel because it really attracts um, swallowtail butterflies and they'll lay their eggs on it and things like that. But if I plant fennel and dill together, fennel wins hands down. Okay, for flavor. Uh, fennel's flavor can overwhelm many vegetables. So it's probably a really good idea to keep your fennel separate. Okay, uh, rue uh, can also be problematic. Not all plants get along with it, but I really put it here because I want you to be aware of the fact that some people have a problem with rue um, being irritating to their skin. 
and so forth. So be aware of that, okay? Um, remember that all plants don't share the same growing traditions or habits, okay? Um, my rosemary tends to wanna be on the dry side where I have other plants that wanna have that moisture. Um, rosemary is gonna love that hot, hot summer sun. But my spinach hates it and my lettuce hates it. So bear that in mind. And I also say that size matters, okay? And it can matter for a couple of reasons. Some plants benefit from the shade of a larger plant, okay? But some plants flounder because they're getting too much shade. So pay attention to the height of the plants, okay? And what you're growing. Good gardening practices that I want you to follow is crop rotation. And don't plant tomatoes or peppers or whatever vegetable you're growing in the same spot year after year, okay? Because it's going to be depleting the soil or maybe it came down with some sort of infestation and so forth. So that if I rotate it, okay, I'm giving it kind of fresh slate to begin with, okay? And you can do that even if you have container beds. I mean, if you only have one bed and it's eight feet long, well, put the tomatoes at the other end, okay? And so forth, just switch it up, okay? But if you have a couple beds, then you'll say, okay, this year, the one on the left, I'm gonna grow my tomatoes and next year I'll put them on the right side, okay? Crop rotation is very beneficial. Farmers know that we should do it as well. Um, follow proper watering, okay? And if at all possible, try not to do overhead watering because that's the time that you're more likely to, um, oh, bring on mildew and things like that and so forth. So if you can have low watering, okay, it's gonna be much better for your plants, okay? And Watch the time of day that you water. Water early in the morning is the best. But if you can't do it early in the morning, if you have to go run off to work and stuff, then come home late afternoon and water. But once more, try to do it from underneath, low to the ground instead of over high. Okay? Only grow vegetables you love. Why grow something if you're not going to eat it? unless you're doing it for your neighbor, okay? So, and finally, I want your garden to make you smile. I want you to be happy in your garden. I want you to look at it and say, look at those blossoms. Oh my goodness, you know, my peppers, they're really flowering. I can't wait. My And look at all the different insects that came when I planted that salvia. And I have those marigolds around. So your garden should be a place of joy. It shouldn't be a chore. It should bring you happiness. And you need to make your garden happy, your vegetables and your flowers by giving them good friends, the right companions, just like you used to tell your kids, right? Make sure who you hang around with is good for you. So these are some of the print resources that I found very beneficial, okay? I can hold up the one book, okay, um, companion planting, and it's an organic gardening tips and tricks for healthier and happier plants. So, but you can also see another great book that I use that was a lot of fun to read. I love the title, Parents Love Tomatoes. And so Secrets of Planting for Successful Gardening, okay. And then Edible Landscaping, because I really truly believe in making the beauty of my garden, okay? So foodscaping and permaculture for urban gardeners. So these are all great print resources that you can look up and check out, okay, to get more information. And now I'm going to share a couple of online sources that I used when I was putting together my presentation. So um, if you go 
and look up um, the University of Minnesota Extension um, and then do a search when you get there and do companion planting in home gardens. They have a lot of wonderful, good advice for you to check out. Um, the next one was kind of fun, companion planting chart for vegetable gardens, tomatoes, potatoes, and more. And that's put out um, by the Farmer's Almanac. And I think I can click on this and you can kind of see it. Let's see if I can do that right now. If I can't get there, oops, let me go back. Oh. All right, it's not letting me click on it. Um, so what I would do is go to the Old Farmer's Almanac and type in a search for guide to companion plants. And they list all sorts of vegetables. They talk about what to plant with it to help them grow better, which ones to avoid, um, garden design, um, and they're affiliated with Proven Winners. Um, they have a lot of very good information for gardening in general, not just companion planting, but you can search on it for companion planting. They have a free newsletter you can sign up for. So just do a Google search to garden design and you'll get to their site. I love the spruce, I use it all the time. It gives me a lot of information um, about things in my house, you know, and things to take care of. But if you go to the gardening section, um, you'll find out some great information there. And they too have a free newsletter that you could sign up for if you're interested. If I could click on this, but it's not letting me, I would also take you to um, the Chicago Botanic Garden. Chicago Botanic Garden actually has um, a garden where they make use of companion plants and they have a terrific article um, with information about companion planting, okay? And then because I am a master gardener through the University of Illinois Extension, I always urge you to go to the University of Extension, go to the gardener's corner, and you can search for information on all sorts of topics that have to do with growing flowers and vegetables. They had some really interesting blog entries all about companion planting that was fun to read. Okay, and I guess it's time for questions. Okay. I know Amy's been watching the chat. I'll let you. Well, yeah, well, let me nice. look at, yeah, I can kind of look at the chat here and see. I actually, uh, in direct message, I sent you a few questions because we had a couple of duplicates. Oh, okay. So if you open your direct message, you should be able to see those. You're, yeah, I'm trying to get my, that. I don't know why it's not letting me get there. Okay, I'm here at the chat. Let's see. All right, so I should start at the top maybe? Sure, <laughs> that'll work. Work my way down, how's yes. that going? <laughs> All right, uh, well, this is the bottom, I guess I'm seeing last. Well, people are saying thank you. So let me start at the bottom okay. and then work my way up. Makes sense, makes sense. Okay. Oh. Okay. Let's see, I'm planting some corn. Can I plant green beans? Actually, purple green beans and squash, butternut. And if you like the chocolate next to the corn. Um, yeah, okay, kind of like the three sisters, if you think about that. If you want to have your squash around the corn, okay, that's going to be beneficial, okay. Um, green beans, the only thing about green beans is if I'm going to use squash with it, I'm worried sometimes about the squash, the vines overtaking the green beans. Okay, so if you plan out your garden properly, you might be able to do it. Okay, but you just want to make sure that you're because squash spreads out. So, um, I personally, I, in fact, I meant to have a picture of it. I think it's great to trellis and to grow vertically and so forth so that I could have my squash growing up vertically and have my green beans around the bottom. Is that making sense? 
Okay, so if you so if I'm using uh, bush beans, I could have those planted around the bottom with some marigolds or things like that. Or I could have my squash growing and have a trellis with my pole beans climbing up that way, okay? Or use the corn to have the pole beans climb on that. So you kind of have to play around a little bit. I hope that helps. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. A good companion plant for kale. I was talking about that. Let's see if I can kind of pull up that slide real fast that we're looking at. Let's see. It's not popping up big for you. So let me kind of just go through some of them again. Okay. So you're gonna have problems and you have holes like inside your kale. Same thing can happen with a switch chart I think you're talking about. And so I want to, um, have, if I have lemongrass around it, um, marigolds, nasturtiums, sweet alyssum are all gonna be very helpful around your kale to kind of deter those insects okay so those would be good companions um i hope that helps a little bit okay and let's see we got another question here planting near okay what do i mean by near okay you mentioned a few times planting near other plants how close in the same bed the same garden etc okay um it kind of depends on your circumstances so if i have a container garden they're going to be real close aren't they? okay and so forth so when you're choosing companions to use in your container um you want to watch the size or make sure you have a bigger container um but for instance, I had mentioned about uh, sunflowers and not to plant them in your garden, but near it. Okay, so I would, so if I had a raised bed, for instance, and I had my vegetables growing, I would have my sunflowers right at the edge in the soil in the other garden next to it, but not directly in the growing bed. Um, once more, we have to talk about the space of it. If you have a garden that's in ground, okay? Um, remember plants need so much room to spread out. So, um, you know, five, six inches, it just kind of depends on the plant and so forth. Once more, you gotta play with it. Um, can I have them in the same bed or should I have them next to it? Well, maybe that mint I kept talking about, put in a pot. Put it next to a container with your other plants or put it next to your bed, okay? Um, but maybe not directly in it. Um, but other plants, when we're talking, like if I have a lissom and I'm growing that, I can have it right there at the bottom. It's a nice low growing plant that I can put it around. Nasturtiums, the same thing. So they're really gonna be like next to our neighbors, like really close, okay? The only thing, once more, you want to consider is nasturtiums like to get some sun. So you want to allow them to get some light and not necessarily get covered by the plants next to them. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. Let's see if I'm hitting another question here. Suzette, I noticed that someone asked if your PowerPoint would be available. Is that possible for us to do? I don't have a particular problem. I certainly know it would be easier for you to read it. So um, have Judy talk to me and we'll see. The only problem with the PowerPoint and sending it out is due to the size. Right. You know, but if email a PDF, it to somebody. we might be able to, we might be able to reduce the size. So we, we can look into that for the okay. people who were interested in the PowerPoint and we will okay. put a message on okay. the fobcon.org site. Okay, yeah. okay. And we can try to do that. Cause like I said, uh, just email it to someone. Okay, we no, talked we about no. beans. Uh, am I missing anything? What, Rutman? 
Suzette, oh, things that there's... don't seem to be listed in the same season. For example, okay. cucumbers, radishes, spring and fall, and so forth. Um, things listed that don't seem to be in the same season. Um, okay, so what happens is we have succession planting and things like that. It can address some of that. Okay, um, I am actually able to grow some crops. So if I have tomatoes that are tall and they're gonna get bigger, they're gonna be shaded. You know, so my radishes can last longer and so forth. Um, and then I can take those out and maybe in the fall then I can put spinach underneath and so forth. So it's a matter of just timing it you know, and so forth. Um, I know, for instance, my lettuce, if I can give it a shady spot, I'm going to extend the season, but it's not going to be terrific at the end of July. The same thing with my spinach mm -hmm. and so forth. So I would be putting in a new crop in the fall. Okay. Um, and then you could always replace the radishes and the things when you take them out um, with flowers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Amy, help me. Am I missing some questions? Yes, I was just gonna say there's one more question and it's okay. do strawberries need to be rotated? Oh, so about the rotation, I mentioned that and what's the specific question about that? Do strawberries need to be rotated? Oh, no, 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 no. Beautiful strawberries. Uh, strawberries um, are wonderful. They're perennial. They're going to come back and so forth. Um, and there is good companion plants for that as well. I look real fast here. Let's see what my organic one says about my strawberries. Um, they're talking more about Alpine strawberries, I think, when I was looking at this before. And so forgive me. I wish I had all this information memorized, but I don't have everything memorized. Well, we can't expect that. That's really? I, you know, you should, you should demand it. You should demand it. That's why we have Google. <laughs> Oh, uh, strawberries, strawberry sound. All right, I'm almost there. Da, 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 da. All right, strawberries. So, friends for strawberries are lettuce, beans, onions, radishes, and spinach. Good herbs to grow with strawberries are coriander, borage, and dill. Okay. Um, if you have your alpine strawberries, they can be planted in a perennial bed with other perennial vegetables, such as asparagus and rhubarb. So you can have all those happy guys all together because they're all perennials, okay? Um, it's the strawberry plants that grow runners work better when planted in single rows down the center of a bed. Um, the author says so she prefers to interplant June bearing strawberries with low growing crops like lettuce and spinach. And a scientific study indicated that interplanting strawberries with lettuce, onions, or radishes actually seem to increase the productivity of the bud in total. And strawberries also produce well when they have borage as a companion and borage is reported to repel pest. I can go on and on with this, but I don't want to bore people just reading to them and so forth, but I hope that gives you a little information. Okay. And then I, you could do a simple search and have strawberries, companion plants, and you'll be able, you know, as long as it's um, a noteworthy site, okay, uh, to get information for that. So I hope it helped a little bit. Is there anything I am? We had um, another question come in, Suzette. Okay. It says, any experience with tomatoes next to cukes? I did that last year, then read somewhere those don't get along well. Um, yeah, that's probably true to some extent. Um, be, and part of the reason is, that they're both heavy feeders. 
Mm. Okay. And so forth. And um, when I told you about how I put my cucumbers in after I take my peas out, in fact, I take the leftover leaves and so forth from the peas, chop them up, put them in the soil around. I actually leave the roots in because they have pulled the um, nitrogen from the air and so forth. And then the cucumbers are gonna benefit from that, okay? And so I'm kind of naturally letting it break down and so forth. Um, so um, my suggestion is that you have your cucumbers as possible up on a trellis maybe and have your tomatoes <clears throat> up further in the bread, in the bed if it's a raised bed, okay, or in one next door to it. Um, and I think the biggest problem is more that they're both heavy feeders, okay? And that's why you might have better success giving them some space, so to speak. Okay, sounds good. And we have any other questions at this point? We only have 13 people on at this point, so we could open it up if okay. people have any other questions. If not, then we're going to uh, thank Suzanne, Suzette for her great presentation. I do want to remind you that um, if you become a member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, there are a lot of benefits. One of the best benefits that we have is the fact that you are allowed to, um, <clears throat> you get reciprocal privileges at over 345 gardens, arboretums, and conservatories in the US by buying a membership with us. By buying a membership with us, you also get reduced price tickets for the garden walk coming up June 25th, eight private and, nine, and one uh, public garden. And we also have reduced price tickets for our Uncork series that takes place the last Friday at of every month in, in the summertime at the conservatory. Um, not to mention, you get to come on to the plant sale, a site earlier than people who are non-members. And actually our plant sale is going on now and will be closing uh, the end of the month on April 30th. So if you go to fopcon.org, you can order your plants from there and you pick them up the week of May 8th. And there's more specific instructions related to that on the site. So we want to thank everyone for coming this evening and enjoy your gardens this summer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Suzette.